Sure. Tech, tech, start. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's get started. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, hopefully enjoying the nice weather here. Uh, welcome to the Ellinger Center for Energy and Environment Highlight Seminar. It's great to see you guys in person, as well as we have audience online as well. Um, uh, so uh, today we're going to have a very distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Nosara from Harvard. I'll, uh, I'll introduce him just in a minute. Uh, but just a, a quick uh, uh, sort of uh, note song. Uh, if you have questions after uh, the presentation, uh, please uh, raise your hand and uh, wait for the microphone to reach you uh, uh, for the uh, folks uh, in this auditorium. And for folks uh, uh, attending our Zoom, please re also raise your hand and uh, till we call your name uh, so you can ask questions. And uh, the last announcement is uh, please keep an eye out on our next highlight seminar on May 12th uh, with uh, Professor Ye Ming Chang at uh, MIT. Um, all right. Now I have most people in here. Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Daniel Nosara. Uh, Professor Nosara is a Patterson Rockwood Professor of Energy at Harvard University. He is a world leading researcher in renewable energy and the inventor of the artificial leaf and the bionic leaf. He developed a completely artificial photosynthesis using on only sunlight, air, and water to synthesize biomass and liquid fuels, and he made it 10 times more than plants can do, 10 times more than natural photosynthesis. Professor Nostara has also achieved renewable and distributed synthesis, uh, synthesis of ammonia and phosphorus um, using the same ingredients, and uh, he will talk about that today. He also invented uh, uh, quite a few other very exciting things, like molecular taking uh, velocimetry to make a simultaneous multi-point veloc velocity measurements of highly three-dimensional turbulent flows. He did the first measurement of uh, an serial proton coupled electron transfer and its application for a variety of medical and engineering applications. And, uh, and my personal actually notes uh, 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 on dance work, I actually I teach a class. Uh, we play a lot of uh, uh, dance uh, TED Talk videos if you, uh, if you want to check it out. It's, it's very inspiring, and also we follow his research uh, very closely. Without further ado, Dan, I'll give it to you. Uh, look forward to your talk. OK. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, um, <clears throat> so it's actually, it's nice to be there and it's nice for you to have me this way. Uh, as my good friend at Princeton there, Dave McMillan would tell you, um, I'm actually pers personally, I'm very annoying. So this is the best of both worlds. Um, you don't have to deal with my personal uh, idiosyncrasies, but you get to hear the science. So um, I'll talk to you today about this distributed carbon and nitrogen fixing cycles, and also phosphorus. Um, and you can start to think about setting up circular uh, uses of those biogenic elements. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to bring up this point. Uh, what we tend to do in energy is we always think of the upper right picture here you know, beautiful blue earth and greenness. And we disconnect it from the human element. Uh, we connect it to the human element that we can ruin the greenness and blue, but there's another human element. And my argument is you can't have the upper right picture if you have poverty. And the reason I say that is through this identity relationship. And what this says is that the energy used, you can break down into three components. So one's population, how many people you have, GDP per capita, 
how rich a country is and then divide it by its population. And then this last number is interesting or quantity parameter, it's energy intensity. So it's energy per GDP. So if you hit a GDP in a country in 2021, and then in 2022, you hit the same GDP and use less energy than you conserved, if you need more, you didn't conserve from the year before. So I like that number and this value because it, it quantifies conservation. But basically, this is an interesting equation because it says N is sociology times economics, business, times science and engineering. So that's the other way you can think about it. Now, this is the equation for the sustainacine. And the reason I say that is it, right now we're burning globally, or you can think about it this way. We have a light bulb on and it's 18 terawatt light bulb. So it's an 18 trillion watt light bulb. It's on all the time and you're giving it energy and the energy you're giving it is mostly carbon, 80, around 81% of the energy to keep the 18 trillion watt light bulb on is carbon. And in the next few years and by the favorite number for all energy and environmental and climate change people, 2050, always go mid-century, I guess. Um, we're going to need around 16 terawatt equivalents more of energy. So the light bulb's going to 34 terawatts. And you can ask why. It turns out in the developed world, this number energy intensity is getting better. We're using less and less energy to, main G, remain, to, to maintain a GDP. So then you can say, well, if the world's getting better at conserving, why do we need so much energy? And it gets right to the point I talked to about, about poverty in emerging nations. Um, in the next, the next 16 terawatts, that's being driven by basically 6 billion new energy users. And so who are they? It's all in the global south, and rural China. I know everybody thinks about China as being developed, but what they forget is half a billion people live in rural China, basically off the grid. And so you have half a billion people there. And then in the global south, you're, you have around two and a half billion people who are low energy users. And then in the next 40 years, you're going to have 3 billion more people added to the face of the earth and they're being added into the parts of the world where you're low energy users. So it comes down to, when you look back at this equation, N is going up by 6 billion, basically, and that's of low energy users. And so one of my arguments, or at least a motivating factor in my group is, if you're going to make a dent on carbon, I know we spend all our time looking out the window with the developed world. Our argument is if you're going to make a major dent in carbon in the next 30, 40 years, you need to worry about the poor and emerging economies. And so once you do that, that's kind of an interesting benchmark because it actually changes your science, or at least it changed our science. And that is if you're going to go to places, and, and the other way to say this is that part of the world hasn't built a massive infrastructure. So you're sitting in a world that's put in tens and tens and tens of trillions of dollars to build an energy infrastructure. The new energy users don't have that infrastructure, so they have to make a decision are they going to redo this or do something new? That's number one. Also, it's unlikely they're going to come up with tens and tens and tens of trillions of dollars in the next 30 years. And so what we decided is, what type of science do we need to address the poor? I'll just say the poor and emerging economies. Uh, what I usually say is non-legacy, meaning they haven't, there's a group of people who haven't inherit an energy infrastructure. You all have inherited an energy infrastructure. And so like you'll hear from Yat Ming Cheng, he's making batteries to plug into the existing energy infrastructure. 
The six billion I'm talking about basically have, don't have an energy infrastructure. And so that means you need new raw materials. And that's why we were driven to sunlight, air, and any water. So no matter who you are, you can look up and see your energy source. Air is around everybody and water is around everybody. Now, not pure water, not clean water, but any water source, including urine even. And so that set this target. Can we do renewable energy and food just using sunlight, air, and water. And that's why uh, we have done, or at least pursued the research that you'll hear about today. And so I, the other thing I say, sunlight, air, and water allows you to be distributed, which is exactly what you need to do to get to places that don't have large infrastructures. And so what is a distributed um, energy machine, and that's outside, and you walk by them every day, and you don't give them the appreciation you should, uh, and that's the leaf, because the entire world you're living in right now, if you look around the room you're sitting in, that was built from photosynthesis, and you all know that that involves sunlight, air, and water, and so the carbon dioxide is absorbed by the leaf, sunlight's absorbed by the leaf, water goes up the uh, system, and then that is magically turned into biomass, sugars, carbohydrate, and oxygen. The one thing that, you, that people forget, and, um, and what's, in, oops, sorry, what's important in this process right here, sorry, my fingers doesn't have the fidelity here, uh, this involves a huge number of protons and electrons. So before I get to the science, I must want to talk about the basic science that we had to invent. And it goes back a long time. So if you start even thinking about water splitting, and I'll show that here, when you split water to oxygen and hydrogen, that's a four proton, four electron process. When you make carbohydrates or fuels, that's an enormous number of protons and electrons. Um, here I'm showing hydrogen split up. So CO2 plus three hydrogens make methanol and water. Three hydrogens you can think of as six protons and six electrons. So there's an enormous proton and electron inventory. And when we, when I was your most of the people in the uh, audience younger, I started realizing this issue of protons and electrons is important. And there hadn't ever even been a measurement or a timing of a proton and electron. So we set out to do that. I won't go into any of the physical chemistry of it, but you probably all remember from your quantum mechanics, electrons spread out and protons are more classical. They're very localized. They tunnel only over short distances due to the difference in mass of 2,000 between the electron and proton. So the electron and proton, it becomes an interesting problem. How do they talk to each other? Because you want to have them talking to each other, other to have an efficient reaction. And so way back in 1992, we made the first measurements where we could time an electron to a proton. And the way you can think about it is, I was going to try to race in a 100 meter dash against an Olympic athlete. Well, of course, I can't win that race unless I cheat. And so the way to cheat is, the Olympic athletes at the starting line, and you're gonna put me right near the finish line, the gun will go off. And then we tune the distance of the proton and the electron from the finish line, so that when the gun goes off, we didn't worry about the gun going off, we only worried about the finish line. And we could put all of our detectors and then watch the electron and pro that basically the electron catch up to the proton at the finish line and then begin talking to each other. So that was the thought process behind the experiments. And then I don't even need, with that explanation, I don't even need to tell you all the science because that seems logical, it worked. And then once we had that with my friend and colleague, Bob Kukier, 
we were able to develop this first, uh, the first theory of proton coupled ET. And that set the entire basis for these reactions on the right and what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, this is, uh, uh, I'm at the center and you all in a very creative way combine biology and chemistry. There's also a way to try to do this just chemically. So for the next thing I want to do is set the stage for why biology is important in this energy game. Uh, not only to learn from it, which we do with an artificial photosynthesis, but use it. And the reason is, and here's a dirty little secret that you're not re reading in all these science and nature articles and these big DOE energy centers. Chemically, it's the world is failing in the energy game. And there's three reasons that it's failing. One is the carbon to fuel carbon efficiency is abysmal. When you're running at high current density, they're under non-steady state conditions. I'll explain that in a minute. And that leads to extremely low energy efficiencies. As a matter of fact, every paper you've read in science and nature claiming they've made a fuel in the last 10 years, every one of those papers, you actually have to put more energy into the system that's, than it's in the title. So let me explain that to you. Every time you reduce the CO2 molecule in water, you make a hydroxide. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the people in this field forgot about what freshman chemistry taught you. And I even had to publish a paper, which I'm kind of embarrassed by because it's to explain freshman chemistry to the elite community of energy science that hydroxide is a base. Remember your inorganic freshman chemistry, carbon dioxide is an acid. So oxides of non-metals are acidic, hydroxide is a base, acid plus base makes a salt carbonate. Now that sounds simple, but the problem is this doesn't involve electrons. It's a non-faradaic efficiency, right? So I'm not passing any electrons. When you read the chemistry literature in the chemical field, they report fat. So how do they avoid this problem? They don't avoid it. They just misreport. They only report Faradaic efficiency. So a Faradaic efficiency is electrons into fuel made. That's great, except that over 99% of the carbon dioxide's making carbonate. So you're seeing when you look at these papers, and, and I mean, students are in the audience, so I want you to think critically when you're reading the literature. When you're reading all these papers that claim Faradaic efficiencies of 80%, 60%, some claim nearly 100%, realize, yeah, it's 90% of a CO2 reaction that's only less than a percent because all the carbon dioxide is going to bicarbonate. And then that causes a problem. So I, I'm just choosing one title here, but there's hundreds of papers like this. This sounds like a pretty impressive title, CO2 reduction to CO with a 19% efficiency using solar light with outdoor solar illumination. Except here, they're not, and, and I know you have engineers in the audience and you know the importance of actually operating steady state, not non-steady state. So what they're doing here is they're flowing hydroxide and they're using hydroxide as a sacrificial reagent. Most of the hydroxide is doing this, it's making carbonate. So they just keep supplying hydroxide. At the end of the day, once you hit steady state, it's all bicarbonate. But by flowing hydroxide in this paper, I did the calculation for every amount, every equivalent of CO, they're making 20 equivalents of hydroxide if I want as a chem engineer to recover that carbonate, which I need to, to have a closed system back to CO2, I, after, I actually have to put six times the amount of energy into the system than I've ever made with the fuel. And 
that's prevalent of the entire field. There's not one paper that's actually energy positive or one system that's energy positive. So again, what's the solution of the field? It's not to address this problem. It's just don't report this and always run under non-steady state conditions. And it turns out that all true energy efficiencies are negative. Okay, are there solutions to this problem chemically? Yes, and there's lots of solutions to it, but I don't wanna talk about those chemical solutions today. What I'm doing with those, these two slides right here is setting up the need for biology. So in biology, you can take the best of both worlds. I'm going to take an inorganic piece, a chemistry piece, and a biology piece. I'll show you why it's the best of both worlds. The best of the biology world is it's overcome the carbonate problem. You don't worry about carbonate in biology because what biology does is it puts CO2 in the form of a carboxylate and then it uses NADH and operates on the carboxylate in a Calvin cycle. And so I call this what I just explained to you, the carbonate catastrophe, the dirty little secret of the field. And biology's overcome that, that problem. Um, I talked to you about PCET. I have a long history in it. I spent 30 years figuring out how to do the water splitting reaction efficiently, and that's only four electrons and four protons. Isopentanol, one of the reactions I showed you, is a 30 proton, 30 electron process. To make CO2 plus hydrogen, to make gasoline, it's a 50 proton, 50 electron process. And what usually happens in chemistry, if you're an electron and a proton, rather than going and reducing CO2, which is difficult, it's a lot better just to combine and make hydrogen. And so biology has managed this PCET problem and is a lot, it allows it to divert all the proton and electron equivalency into fuel formation. And it's highly selective. And so today, what I want to do is show you how you can interface inorganic chemistry with biology and do something useful. Um, I want to return to the photosynthetic reaction. It's pretty simple. We teach it in high school. CO2 plus sunlight and water makes carbohydrate and oxygen. But what we forget in the field is there's a light and dark reaction. And so the plant is only using the sunlight to split water. And that is for the reason way back here. Sorry, I'm going to come way back here. The water splitting reaction is uphill by 1.23 volts. So that's why you need to put, that's how you're storing solar light. You're taking the bonds of water, rearranging them in, into oxygen and hydrogen. That's thermodynamically uphill. Once you have the hydrogen, H2 plus CO2 is thermoneutral or downhill for almost any reaction. I could write hundreds of reactions here and they're all thermoneutral or downhill. So the reason why biology uses sunlight, it's only using sunlight to split water to oxygen and hydrogen. And again, biology is smart. Hydrogen's a gas, so it's hard to store. So the way biology stores hydrogen is in the form of NADPH. That's basically a hydride H minus, and then it combines it with an H plus, but not to make hydrogen in the CO2 reduction cycle. It keeps the hydride separate from the proton. And the hydride actually attacks CO2 to make the carboxylate, and then you protonate. So the, if you're going to simulate artificial photosynthesis in your head then, you should split up the two reactions. First, you need to do the light reaction, then you do the dark reaction. And for the light reaction, there's real benefits of using inorganic chemistry. So where is the problem with the biology? Here is the Z scheme of photosynthesis. There's two cofactors, P680, P700. You absorb two photons. And then I have an energy scale here. It's all been worked out in photosystem one and two. This is the front end of photosynthesis to do water splitting and make NADPH plus oxygen. And if you do the math here, you find out that the system's storing only 28% of its energy efficiency. 
So sunlight in to NADPH and oxygen, you're storing 28% of the energy. And then when you finally take the absorption spectrum of the leaf and overlay it with the sun, the maximum efficiency is 10.5%. Now, I'm not getting down on photosynthesis. As a matter of fact, I hear people do this all the time and they say it's, it's very inefficient. Realize that photosynthesis is massively efficient. It's just not storing the energy. When it's stepping down here along these electron transport chains, it's actually using that energy and it's pumping protons because the leaf needs to live. So just like today, you're gonna to eat food, you're gonna to try to not store it, you're gonna to try to use it only and not store it. Well, nobody unfortunately told photosynthesis 2 billion years ago, it should evolve to become an oil well. That's not what its goal was. Its goal was to live and then make enough stuff to grow. And so this is an amazingly efficient machine. It just wasn't evolved to do energy storage, okay? But the point in fact, when we get to energy storage, it's not storing a lot of energy. It's using most of the energy. So you can get a much higher efficiency solar to fuels if you can replace the front end of photosynthesis. And so that's what we set out to do. I won't talk about these catalysts. We, we made this cobalt catalyst in 2008, and it's been kind of set off the field of OER um, in, in a sense. Before that, there was only this thing called the ruthenium blue dimer. Everybody was working on molecules in inorganic chemistry. But this compound here, which is a little cluster, it, it usually ranges from 10 to 12 atoms. What you do is you just put cobalt in solution, cobalt two. I oxidize it to cobalt three. We looked in a freshman chemistry book and we said, what anion would we need to set up an equilibrium to make a solid cobalt oxide? And it turns out it was phosphate. So in the presence of phosphate and cobalt two, when you oxidize the cobalt three, these metal clusters will form on a range of eight to 12 atoms. They're heterogeneous. We make sure that it, when we set up the equilibrium, it precipitates out on the electrode. And these are really superb water oxidation catalysts. There's a huge literature now around these catalysts for doing water oxidation. The four protons and electrons left behind, we fed in we, to a nickel molybdenum zinc alloy. So we did a chem engineering technique. We took nickel molybdenum zinc. And then what we did is we de-alloyed. We basically dissolved out the zinc to go to zinc two. And that left a spongy nickel molybdenum. That's a chem engineering trick called de-alloying. But it turned out for the biology, which I'll talk about in a minute, this wasn't compatible. The, the, the nickel and molybdenum were not compatible. So we came up with this formulation. If you take cobalt metal with the 6% phosphorus alloy, the element of phosphorus, so you make a cobalt phosphide, this thing is a superb hydrogen catalyst in natural waters. So both of these things work in natural waters. And remember, one of my requirements is we needed to be in natural waters, sea, including seawater, lake water, urine. Now, what makes that hard? Usually when you do water oxidation, you're in concentrated base. And the reason is, is when you make, when you oxidize water, you make protons. And there's this formalism in inorganic chemistry called the Lux flood formalism. And it turns out in pH seven water, Remember, hydroxide's concentration is only 10 to the minus seventh molar. So the most basic thing is the oxide itself. And so what happens is a proton reacts with base. It corrodes the oxide, dissolves it. And so you get corrosion. This is an old problem. So that's why everybody runs in base, because as soon as you make the proton, you sponge it away with hydroxide in solution. But I can't afford to start shipping, you know, 18 mega ohm water in concentrated base all around the world. You just want to use any water source. 
So the idea that those catalysts are based on are called self-healing. So I told you, we do this pre-catalytic state. We take cobalt-2 in solution, oxidize it, and make the cluster. So we self-assemble it. And we can self-assemble that at a volt, one volt applied potential. The water oxidation at pH 7 is carried out at 1.25 volts. So what's neat is as long as this catalyst is doing water oxidation, if the catalyst corrodes and begins dissolving, I have enough energy in the system because this blue E applied is 1.25 volts, self-assembly is a volt, I can always repair the catalyst. And that's shown here. These blue squares is the line as a function of pH and applied voltage. So at pH 7, I told you, we run this at 1.2 volts, this cobalt phosphate catalyst to make oxygen. And the self-assembly process, which is more complicated, we work this out. It's an inverse third order in proton, so it's a much steeper slope from and then water oxidation. And so because of that steeper slope, it doesn't cross the water line until around pH five. So as long as I'm in this green region, I always have enough potential in water splitting to repair the catalyst. And so the way you can think about this from an engineering sense, this catalyst turnover number is infinite. Turnover number is how many times does it turn over before it dies? As long as I'm in the green square here of pH, pH five or higher, this catalyst never dies. And so it's a cell, it's the first what we call self-healing catalyst, meaning its turnover number is infinite. So that allows you to use any water source. We've done all these, Charles River, Boston Harbor, we've taken puddles off the ground. We've run it in urine. Um, it allows you to integrate to materials easily. That's important because a lot of inorganic materials aren't stable in concentrated base or acid. And important to today, it also allows us to integrate with biology easily. Now, what I just showed you with these catalysts to do water splitting, there's no sunlight in them. So, what we did is we looked at a solar panel. And so what happens in a solar panel? Sunlight comes into the silicon. You get an electron in a hole. You separate them. And then on the, you put a wire on the top. You put a junction in between. So the electron and the hole that's generated by sunlight can't combine and make heat. You draw the current off the negative. And, um, electrode effectively, and then you put it back in the positive. And so you allow the electrons and protons to combine in an, electron, an external circuit. So what we decided to do is we needed this type of idea, but no wiring. And so what we did is we took three flavors of silicon. This is amorphous silicon. Silicon usually absorbs way out in the visible, but if it's amorphous, it's a strained lattice. And because the lattice is strained, it opens up the band gap. So the, that spectrum on the top right, where it says top, that's the top layer of amorphous silicon. It absorbs around 400 nanometers. Then you look at the periodic table right below silicon is germanium. It's a bigger atom than silicon. So we can begin doping amorphous silicon or germanium, and that relaxes the bonds. As the bonds relax, the band gap shrinks. And depending on where I want to stop the absorption spectrum, I just keep adding germanium. So we add enough germanium in the middle uh, piece of silicon to absorb at 600. And then we add a lot more germanium and we get the bottom spectrum. And now when you integrate, over the three slabs of silicon, you cover the entire absorption spectrum. So here's a big gain from photosynthesis. I'm now absorbing basically every light photon coming from the sun, which photosynthesis can't do. And I'm not, what, I'm not using my proton gradient to live. I'm using it all to do chemistry. And so this is what we call the artificial leaf 
because so here, this is sitting in my um, window right next to me. You just drop it in water, sunlight's coming in, you're getting the whole separation. When four holes go to the top layer, I'm making O2, the electrons are going to the back layer, the four electrons, and that's then taking, they're combining with the four protons and making hydrogen. So with the silicon that's in there, which was a 15%, so that's sunlight to electricity, no wires, um, the overall solar to hydrogen efficiency is 12.8%. Now we don't do this anymore, but the field has gone on and the field is going to hit efficiencies between 18 and 20% using silicon, which is great. You can even use more expensive things, but silicon is important because China has made a massive investment in silicon and that's basically the price point for solar energy generation. So we can split water really efficiently. We can now offload photosystem one and two. So here's photosystem two where you make oxygen. The electrons will run along the membrane. They're relayed through a quinone pool and cytochrome B6F. It's just photosynthesis. And then they're, they head over photosystem one. There's P700. It uses a second photon to pump that up. And then the electrons uh, go through a, a nine paradox in a base and make NADPH. So this whole front end of photosynthesis, I can get rid of now with the artificial leaf and the catalyst of the artificial leaf. The NADPH is an issue. How do I get hydrogen to NADPH? That's your first challenge. Once I have NADPH though, I'm golden because I can use the NADPH as a hydrogen source and then ATP aces use NADPH to make ATP. So I can take solar water splitting and store it as hydrogen and NADPH and use some of that NADPH to make cellular energy to drive cellular function. And so that now leads me to running the dark reaction. And that's what we do. Um, I take photosystem one and two, get rid of them. So we took a basically symbio chassis, Ralstonia eutropha. And we just genetically engineered more hydrogenases into the membrane. And a hydrogenase takes H2 to two protons and two electrons. And I can then couple hydrogenases to NADPH reductase to make NADPH. So by playing that little trick, I can get to this point, NADPH, and then use the NADPH to make ATP. I'm not showing you all the chemistry and drive the Calvin cycle. So first off, one thing you can do, and I know a lot of people do biofuels in, in Princeton in the center, you can just grow the bugs. So in other words, these bugs though are kind of messed up they don't eat sugar. Remember, sugar comes from things you grow out of the ground and, the, and that has a limited solar efficiency photosynthesis. This is using inorganic chemistry to grow. So these bugs die if they don't have hydrogen. Their only food source is hydrogen through a hydrogenase. So you can grow them and make biomass or you can do synthetic biology, which we did. We put in these four genes, for instance, to make isopropanol those genes put in these four enzymes and you use your organic chemistry. And it takes basically acetyl coenzyme A does a carbon-carbon bond formation, hydrolysis, and then dehydration to make isopropanol. So that is this um, red bar right here. If I just let the bugs grow, this is a true solar efficiency now. This is like, I weigh the biomass and I know how much hydrogen I have. Um, so, and by the way, it has the hydrogen solubility in there. It has everything. So I'm taking solar to hydrogen, like I told you before, and then I'm taking that hydrogen to biomass. And so that I could just grow my biomass at 11%. And my argument is anybody doing biofuels should be using this as their feedstock, not something that grows out of the ground because the best biomass is a percent. 
the best biomass. Most things are way less than that. Um, you can also do other things. That blue, I'm not showing you the sin bio of this, but that blue bar is to make isopentanol, C5. <laughs> the 30 proton, 30 electron reaction. The purple bar is important because that purple bar makes polyhydroxybutyrate. So instead of making a fuel, we put a transporter to get the fuel out of the bug. And by the way, isopentanol is nice because I can just, it's immiscible with water. But here I don't make a fuel. I tell the bug become hibernate and make polyhydroxybutyrate. So be like a bear, hibernate and get fat during the winter because I'm gonna need you in the summer. So this is a way to make solar energy or if, if you're a runner, I'm carbohydrate loading the organism with, with hydrogen and P PHB. And then the bug can draw on PHB to make NADPH and ATP. One other thing I want to point to is the, da the dashed bar versus the solid bar. The solid bar is pure CO2, and we're hitting 11%. The dash bar is air when we do the same process using air. And remember, the concentration difference is 2,500. But we're only seeing a hit in efficiency of around 2.5. And that's because the organism has carbon concentrating mechanisms, which have also, we haven't even engineered to optimum ability yet. But, you know, grass is going to catch every CO2 running by it. So you get a huge benefit of biology of using carbon concentrating mechanisms. So that's one thing you can do, make fuels. And like it was said in the intro, you can be way better than photosynthesis. There's one, and, and now you can think about a distributed fuel cycle for just using sunlight, air, and water, any water source. There's one other thing just for me to close, and that's nitrogen in the air. And nitrogen is important for food and ammonia. Now, what we just did is important for when we did this and we could load lots of PHB into the bug, we realized this is really important for the nitrogen cycle. And the reason for that is when you take nitrogen to ammonia via nitrogenase, nitrogen fixing cycles in biology, it's one of the most energy expensive processes in biology per nitrogen to make an amount two ammonias per one nitrogen molecule, you need 16 ATPs. And so what happens in biology is organisms downregulate nitrogen production. So if they can do it, Ralstonia eutrophic can't do it. So we, we did a bioinformatics search for a bacterium that had parallel carbon and nitrogen cycles. And so there's a lot of bugs out there that want to fix nitrogen or can fix nitrogen, but they don't because they'll get exhausted and they'll die. They'll use all their energy fixing nitrogen instead of living. So they downregulate. But because we can give it PHB, that bug is happy and it says, I don't need to downregulate nitrogen fixation because I'm not going to run out of energy because like I said, we carbohydrate loaded it. And that's exactly what happens. So taking this bug, we do a three-step process, do water splitting, feed hydrogen into bug, but don't make a fuel now. The green dot is polyhydroxybutyrate. In this bug, which is called a xanthobacteria, we can also concentrate phosphorus out of wastewater urine. So I can load up the bug with PHB and polyphosphate. And now I don't need the sun anymore because I've taken the sun, stored it in the rearranged bonds of oxygen and hydrogen, biological hydrogen, and then fixed it with carbon dioxide to make an internal fuel for the bug. So I've stored solar fuel in the bug. I can then put the bug underground. It doesn't need to see the sun anymore and I can grow crops. And this is just showing you with N15 labeling all the ammonias from N15. I can then run a 
an assay off nitrogenase, so I can actually just simply measure. What you do here is I'm making one mole of hydrogen per every two moles of uh, ammonia. That's the nitrogenase cycle. So I can take acetylene and reduce acetylene to ethylene. That's the assay to get turnover number and frequency. And what you see here is each xanthobacteria that's loaded with PHB is fixing nit nitrogen at 1.4 times 10 to the fourth nitrogens per second in a cell. So these things are humming away because they're happy energetically. I told you I can put the bugs in the ground and I can start getting rid of chemical fertilizer. So chemical fertilizers, nitrate and ammonia, but my bugs are doing Haber-Bosch on the fly at the root of the plant. So in the middle panel, this we, we do everything third party, so we can't you know, uh, it be what's totally on the up and up. It's a third party. They're even blind. I'm blind to the fertilizers they're using. I just tell them what to do. And so here on this farm, which grows lettuce and corn, it uses 130 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And this was a 400 acre farm. And um, in the middle, it's what the farmer usually does. And on the right, I've replaced 90% of the chemical fertilizer with the bug. So there's only 10% chemical fertilizer. I need nitrate to do a little boost to get root formation and then the bugs attach. And then I replace 90% of the chemical fertilizer with the bug which is fixing nitrogen on the fly. So per acre, you can see we get equivalent yields. We actually get a little bit higher yield. Um, we're able to replace 170 pounds of nitrogen with the bug. Now, why that's important is when you do nitrogen fixation, you're using methane. Here's a BASF Harbor Bosch plant. And so you're making a lot of carbon dioxide. Some of you are probably familiar. That's the third largest CO2 emitter. And it's a huge energy user to feed the world doing Harvard Bosch. And in this experiment, this one field trial I just showed you, we're running around 20 in the US right now, a lot in Salinas Valley in California. Um, how we saved by going to 117 pounds of nitrogen per bug and not chemical fertilizer, we save 225,000 pounds of carbon dioxide from being emitted. And then remember, the bug is pulling carbon uh, dioxide from the air through CCMs to make PHB. So on that 400 acre farm trial, we sequester 229,000 pounds of CO2 in PHB. And so the total CO2 saving with sequestering and avoiding Haber Bosch for that one farm trial I just showed you, we save a quarter million pounds of CO2 from going into the atmosphere. So this actually makes a real dent on the carbon problem. And what's nice, you know, when you do synthetic biology, you always see people trying to make a high value drug or something so they can keep moving forward with their synthetic biology. Instead of a drug, you're using fertilizer. And that already has a market. That's number one. I don't have to invent it. And two, it's a huge carbon emitter. And so we're really happy with this parallelism between fuels and food because this is a very big need in terms of CO2, which can then drive the synthetic biology. Finally, I should just add, because we can grow in nutrient depleted land. So if I put these bugs, you're putting carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus back into the, into the earth. And so um, we've shown that you can grow out of sandy soils. You can imagine there's a lot of people around the world right now interested in the, the, fuel, the Haber Bosch part, or what we call the bionic leaf end. So with that, I just wanted to show you that you can literally just use sunlight, air, and water, any water, the starting material. You can do distributed fuel cycles and food cycles. So it's basically distributed Fischer tropes and Haber-Bosch. 
And that makes us really happy because it's distributed with simple inputs. It's adaptable to places that don't have large infrastructure. For us, that target is the next 6 billion big energy users that will be coming to the planet in the next 30 years. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I will surely answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, this very inspiring work. Uh, not only you are saving energy and CO2 emissions, but uh, I imagine you will save a lot of lives on Earth. Thank you for doing amazing research. Um, um, so we'll have a, a, a few minutes uh, to, uh, to have a Q&A session. Uh, anybody has a question um, in the audience, uh, please wait for the mic. Uh, please uh, uh, intro uh, announce, uh, introduce yourself first, because uh, I don't think Dan can see everybody uh, clearly, uh, and then uh, ask a question. Hi, I'm Tim. thank you for that. It, it's Tim Searchinger. I'm at the, the School of Public and International Affairs. I work on food, too. So wh what are the next steps? I mean, what, uh, what, what needs to happen to start putting your uh, process into commercial operation? Okay, so I, I got to tell you, for fuels, the next step is car. You're, you're a policy person, you said. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a I'm basically a food and agriculture person, but I okay. also do some extent on energy. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the two magic words: carbon pricing. So for fuels, you're gonna need carbon pricing, and the reason is, and and I, I this really annoys me when I hear people in science say oh, it's still too expensive, or we need to be cheap. Um, any economist is going to tell you, if you have a $100 trillion paid off infrastructure, paid off, you tell me what you're going to do anytime soon to, to uh, challenge a, a massively paid off infrastructure. So as long as we keep putting a straw in the earth and sucking oil out of the ground, you're never going to be cheaper than that. So you're going to need carbon pricing on the fuel side to implement. And that's true of any solar to fuels process. And don't let any scientists tell you they have a cheap way to do it. it will, it's impossible without carbon pricing. But on the food side, we have a ready-made market um, and it's already taken off, I should tell you. It's being commercialized. And we're right now at 50 cents per pound of nitrogen, real cost. And what made it happen, by the way, was engineering. When I did this in my lab, I was at what's called a colony forming unit, which is the density of bacteria. We were around 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7. But with reactor design, which we did in the last two years, I did that off campus, we're now at 10 to the 10th, going to 10 to the 11th. And at 10 to the 10th, we're at 50 cents per pound of nitrogen. And that's already commercially viable. As a matter of fact, for the organic food market, we're way cheaper than any fertilizer. So. I told you I'm running huge field trials in the US. A lot of them are in, with companies that you see in Whole Food because they can replace chemical fertilizer. By the way, you don't get any runoff. It's doing direct injection. We have the data showing there's no nitrogen runoff. So that's nice in addition to the CO2. And so what is nice about this, and that's what I was trying to say at the end, we actually have a market that's readily here, it's here right now, and we're already price competitive. And so it's getting commercialized as we speak, the nitrogen piece, and it's for sustainable agriculture. And what's the actual chemical then? I mean, what, what's, what are you doing? You're spraying something on the plant or what's- Yeah, and then we take the, the chemical as the bug. Mm -hmm. And by the way, isn't this neat? I can sell it because of how crazy people are with how they, they label chemicals. Think about it. I have a chemical free fertilizer because the bug hasn't started making any nitrogen the way agricultural field values or they, they put chemicals. It's how much nitrogen is in the, in the fertilizer. 
my fertilizer starts off with zero nitrogen. And so what we do at 10 to the 10th colony forming unit, we, for, for a farm that I was just showing you, we give them around 200 milliliters of the bugs and they just drop it into their irrigation system. You can do drip irrigation or spray. And then it just gets sprayed onto the field and the bugs go down and find the root and attach to it and then start doing, um, start doing the fertilization. So the thing we make is we take the bugs where we've fixed both the PHB. So we've done the front end where we made them carbohydrate loaded and with PHB and we do polyphosphate. And then we take the bugs and just give it to the farmer and they just put it in their water supply and spray it on their field and they're good to go. Thank you so much, Tim. That's an excellent question. Um, others in the audience? Christos? Thank you for a great talk. Uh, Christos Maravellas from Anliger Center in Chemical and Biological Engineering. Uh, so, so maybe just a big picture thought about the use of hydrogen. I, if we can get cheap uh, renewable hydrogen, then we know we, we have many routes to many fuels and, and chemicals. Your, your thoughts, is it, yeah. should we be employing biology or, or what's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you, so first off, if, if we wanted to, and we had a hydrogen infrastructure, we wouldn't be talking about fuels. You just would use hydrogen, but you got to build the infrastructure. And then what you're bringing up is a great point. If I get renewable hydrogen, and it really that comes down to the cost of electrolysis and that price is coming down more and more, you could just plug in hydrogen to a Harbor Bosch plant or to a fuels plant, do Fisher Trucks, Chem Engineering. But again, that's only going to work in the developed part of the world. So I'm a huge fan of that. But you're not going to be building that infrastructure for the poor anytime soon. And nobody has any appetite to build it for them because they, the world now needs a return on investment of, you know, four months. And so I, I really think you, when you think about energy and the way you're thinking, you got to almost have a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde personality where you say, what science am I gonna do for a large built-in infrastructure? And that is different than the science I'm talking about for the poor. So, um, and that's how we think. And everything I just talked to you about, I, th I think mostly is for the poor of the world. I don't worry about this part of the world. Now, fortuitously, because the fertilization thing is working so well, you know, even BASF now is calling us wondering, should we be partnering? So that that one place I overlap with this part of the world. But what I talked about is really for the poor, where you have simple inputs. What you're talking about, I think, is viable for the developed world. And people should keep doing that. And people are working hard to keep trying. You know, DOE is now saying their target's $1 per kilogram of hydrogen. We'll see if they get there. Right now, it's around $5 per kilogram of hydrogen. Thanks so much, Christos. I have two questions I'll just answer quickly on in, in the chat. So one asked about cobalt, its reaction and secondary physical fate besides oxidation and reincorporation into the catalyst surface. So the cobalt all goes back. And I should tell you now we use a nickel borate catalyst. So when the thing is running, and I don't wanna get into all the details, but the self-exchange electron transfer kinetics is fast enough that you hardly dissolve any nickel or cobalt. What we found is using 57 cobalt, which is super radioactive, over the course of a week, we would lose around 0.1% that we would have to reincorporate. So it's, it's pretty happy. Um, I will say though, on the hydrogen side, the bugs don't like nickel or molybdenum, but they were really happy with the cobalt and phosphide. It's, unfortunately, I have a cobalt phosphate oxidation catalyst and a cobalt phosphide hydrogen catalyst. 
So we actually had to be attentive to the metal because even the even nanomolar concentrations of nickel and molybdenum were interfering with the bioorganism. And so the cobalt phosphide is a biocompatible. And then one other good question. I told, I mentioned that we're sequestering 29,000 pounds of carbon dioxide in the PHB. And then the question is, yeah, but you're out in a field. What's the real life cycle of carbon? And you're right. It finally will go back into the atmosphere over, you know, 10 years probably. So I don't look at that as a carbon sequestration uh, method. Um, it's a short-term one. The CO2 savings on Harbor Bosch is a real, real saving. What you're saying, the question, if I take a long enough period, doesn't all the carbon in the field go back to the atmosphere? But I do wanna bring up another point. If you can, I know that I have a lot of friends who do mechanical engineering and wanna scrub CO2. Well, that's around an $800 to $1,000 per metric ton process. And even the biggest oil companies like Total are estimating, and they're doing big, they're doing big demo projects in the world. They're estimating $800 per metric ton. That's why growing things is nice. So here, you're on a much lower cost curve. So it's something we haven't really worked out and analyzed. But if you can grow biomass really quickly at high energy efficiency, you could think about burying the biomass and, and sequestering it away for a long time below a soil level. So that's something we've been thinking about as a carbon sequestration method is you, I call it fast agriculture. So use fast agriculture to do CO2 sequestration and then bury. As I mentioned before, I think this is the only way to do biofuels. You should just be using 10% or even higher. We haven't, I, I, I think, you know, people in the center, if they started wanting to engineer organisms just to bring in lots of carbon and even grow faster, they're going to do way better than our 11%. We just started this. So I, I see a lot of headroom here. And that might be a real way to do a cheaper cost curve for carbon sequestration. Okay, those were those two questions. I think I took care of them. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, I think uh, uh, I don't see any questions in here either. Um, let's uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Nosara again uh, for the amazing talk. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Hopefully, I'll see you in person soon. Okay. Yeah, yeah. bye. Bye-bye.